welcome back to the Pew, everybody. I am your host, John Edwards, and I am super excited today to be bringing you a bonus episode of Just a Guy in the Pew. If you follow what we've been doing in the ministry, you know every once in a while we're really graced and blessed to have a wonderful guest, and and today is no different. Uh, I have a very good friend in my life here today, Father Malachy. He is a CFR, and if you don't know what that is, that's a Franciscan friar of the renewal. They are tremendous, tremendous gifts to the church. Uh, He is a tremendous gift to me. He is one of the selected preachers for the National Eucharistic Revival. So I know you've probably heard Victor and I talking about that on a couple of shows. Uh, We've been asked to do some things in conjunction with all of that. But I was so blessed to bring him into our parish through our nonprofit Pew Ministries here in Memphis to lead an Advent Eucharistic mission. So he's in town. He's staying here at the, the house with us, and it's been such a joy to have him. So without further ado, I'd like to bring over my buddy, my good friend, and uh, a great father in my life, Father Malachi. Thank you, John. Dude. Awesome. Great to be here, bro. Seriously. It is. Hey. I, I feel like there's going to be a lot of dude bros. In dude bro. Interview. Bro dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But dude, it's such a blessing to have you here. It really is. Amen. And, and just to bring you to our hometown and you know we had the first night of the mission last night and yeah. man just to see a night of confession and, and oh dude yeah and those wonderful sisters dominican sisters yes. that were singing holy and, cow oh, yeah a little was, piece of heaven man it was it was yeah. and and you know one thing that you did last night um that, that i really appreciated was sharing your testimony hmm. you know and uh so you and i have obviously been talking about this for a while you coming mm-hmm. in and having an opportunity to come in the yeah. studio and do things and there's a lot of things people have asked us to do. You know, either the USCCB wanted some stuff on the on the Eucharist, and we're going to get to that in another episode. Yeah, uh, we're going to do some stuff on Advent. But I just I found it really profound and life changing a lot when priests mm. share how they became a priest. And yeah, I think sometimes there's a there's a this just idea from people that like priests come out of the womb holy with like a bible <laughs> and holy water and it's like here i am lord like, yeah right robe me you know yeah. and, and and it obviously isn't that way for a lot of people and yeah. so i know from hearing your story and in our growing friendship uh yeah. that you didn't have the easiest way yeah. to the lord uh and so i just man wanted to have this time as as long as the lord wants us to use it and just to allow you to to pour out yourself who you are and how you came to be who you are and, and the whole yeah, journey there yeah well Bro, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> and it is, for me, it's always a joy. There, I have to say, like, the thing that is the greatest uh, joy in my life is the opportunity to share about what he's done for me. Yeah. And that's just, like, hands down. I just love talking about it because <laughs> I love talking about him. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, I'm from Georgia originally and uh, still celebrating SEC champs. Come on, go dogs! <laughs> go dogs. <there>. Um, <laughs> sorry for all you LSU fans out there. Knew that was coming. But uh, anyhow, <laughs> but... Grew up in Georgia, the second of eight kids in my family. And my family, they were they were really um, awesome mom and dad, faith-filled, part of a charismatic community. And so from the youngest of age, I was around people who like believed in Jesus, who mm-hmm. believed in God, who practiced their faith, Sunday Mass, every single week, catechesis, all that kind of stuff. And I grew up in this atmosphere of faith. Um, and And really, as I look back on my life, that journey kind of unfolded and until the time where I hit the like you know turbulent years of middle school, holy freaking cow! <laughs> yeah. Middle school is like just outrageous, right? Yeah, um, torture for kids. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and and there's also like all this all this questions that arise that you weren't thinking about. Like before, you were just like you know like picking your nose and like thinking about your next like baseball game. I might still pick my nose, but I'm not so much thinking <laughs> about right. the baseball game now. But but at that point, you start asking questions about like kind of like where do I fit in? Who am I? Yeah. Um, and I remember this real insecurity kind of came up in my life and it came up and it's interesting. I know this is a show we're talking to men. Yeah. Um, and as I look back on my story, I recognize that that it kind of came up, um, because of important men in my life who I was looking to, but I just wasn't able to receive for different reasons from them. One, um, very sadly with my faith, I had a, a, uh, the youth leader that was like the guy, the young, you know, oh, sure. kind of like what a youth pastor would be, right? He was just like, oh, look at this dude. He's on fire for Jesus. He's, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, and and then there was some scandal, and he kind of fell away, and we were just mm-hmm. totally like our faith got rocked by that. Um, there was another older man in the in the community that my parents were a part of who was really like a spiritual father to a lot of us. And he kind of, he ended up going to seminary, which is great. Sure. But it meant that he wasn't around, and my experience of it was kind of an experience of being orphaned. Mm. Um, and all of a sudden there's an absence of a figure 
Um, and my own dad, who, oh my goodness, I love that man. I'll talk about him in some other episodes because sure. like receive so much from him. But there were struggles in that time of my life where I just felt like I, I couldn't open my heart. I couldn't really be who I was with him. And so I started asking that question, like, who am I? Yeah. Um, where am I going to find my place in life, in the world? And and you start doing what the, like what everybody does. You look around your friends. What are they doing, right? Sure. Um, and <laughs> and at that point, some of my friends and one of my older brothers in particular just started making a lot of stupid decisions, which yeah. we all do in middle school, right? Sure, like everybody yeah. makes really stupid yeah. in high school, and some just perpetuate throughout life. Unfortunately, I still think I have the detention and the demerit marks. Oh, right? dude, no. <laughs> all right, no, I, 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 I might one up you. All right, so okay, <laughs> this might like scandalize people out there who are all like you know raised by the people with pop culture parenting that said don't spank. But like, I went to one of these schools in the south. It was a private school. They were still spanking kids. Oh yeah. All right, so and I was under like penalty in in middle school that like. Anytime I got a, a, a demerit or anything that happened, whatever it was, automatic spanking. Oh, wow. Because I was just like, I was revolving door at the principal's office, you know. <laughs> sure. But I think it was mainly because I was ADHD and I just got distracted. And you're like telling me sit still in class all day long. And I'm yeah, like, sure. you know, and at some point, you know, I'm going to start looking around and like spit balls or I'm. A, yeah. But anyhow, so I drove my teachers nuts. Um, and my friends that I was hanging with at that time they started off on a path, which is basically like, we're all going to like be rebels, man. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it wasn't like, I mean, it wasn't so much like Johnny Rebel. It was more like, you know, we're going to be skater punk Pushing kids. Pushing the limits. Pushing and, the limits, yeah. you know. And it was so hilarious. Like, I look back and I was like, I was trying to create myself this image of like, I'm being persecuted and oppressed by the man, oh, you know. <laughs> sure. And so I had a skateboard and I was like, you know, it was like running around. Like, we we're like trying to like vandalize things. We're going to like, you know go to concerts and jump in mosh pits and we're angry at the world. It's like, Cause, ah! Cause like, a skateboard has always helped you, uh, escape perseverance or uh, oh, yeah. persecution, right? A- al- always bro. You can actually move pretty fast. Fa- in one of yeah. those things. Holy Faster cow. Faster than walking. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but, um, but I remember I, you know, I kind of fell into that lifestyle and, and, and with it, all the dumb things and the damaging things that come with it. And I remember that was a time where like people started introducing me to things like pornography. That was a time yeah. where people started introducing me to drinking and then drugs. And what, what age would you say? Uh, it was between like 13 to 14 years okay. old. Yeah. So that was kind of like the tipping point. God, it's scary. My son's 13. Yeah. yeah. And it was, it was, and it was, it was a moment where all of a sudden all these things happened in my life and I had this great formation, um, but I was just wrapped in this fear about like, you know, rejection. Mm -hmm. And I was wrapped in this fear of like, I'm not really sure where I fit in and I don't really know who I am. And so I've got to figure this out now. And, and I looked around, right. And like, and what is this? Like prove yourself, right. Either through like, you know, some awesome, you know, dangerous trick that you're going to do on a skateboard. Sure. Prove yourself by how many bottles of whatever you can slam on a weekend night, you know, prove yourself by how far you've gone, what you've done with this girl, like prove yourself. And I was caught up in this, right? Like I'm going to show other people, right. I'm going to show these guys I'm a real man. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And (laughs) And what did it get me? It got me being expelled from high school in my the um, the end of my sophomore year. Because, so, but you didn't have anybody at this time. Like, so you had your dad. You had some friends that obviously were not the greatest of influences. It sounds like, yeah. But you, your youth pastor was out of the picture, yeah. And the other guy left. So like, you had no one really in your life. There to, were some people trying to reach out. Like yeah. I, I can look back and I can see there was one of my childhood friends that now is just a some of my best friends now. Kind of as the journey took its full circle, but I distanced myself from the people that were making different decisions. Okay, and and I see some of that too. My older brother was on a track, and I was really like following. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to say that my decisions and my bad choices are his fault, but that was a big part of the picture. Like, you know, it's like my older brother. I want to be with him. He's, sure. You know. Yeah. The example. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so I just, it was, it was like feeling that peer pressure and not having a deep enough sense of like who I was to be able to resist it. Yeah. And then just, you make a decision and all of a sudden you're like, Oh, that felt good. Sure. Um, or I make a decision. I'm like, I want to get out of here, but I don't know how. Hmm. Yeah, I'm familiar with that feeling. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I'm like I'm I'm struggling and I'm I'm expelled from high school and I'm dealing with this shame of like, you know, this public exposure of, you know, as I started, you know, breaking in and stealing to be able to pay for drugs, you know. Wow. I mean 
And at that point, I wouldn't say as much because it was like an addict, but it just like made you cool and popular, right? Sure. And it's like your buddy's like, oh, sweet, dude, you're buying all, you know, yeah, yeah, I got you, man, you know? Yeah. And, what what drugs were you doing, if you don't mind me asking? Was it like, um, yeah, I mean, I would say like party drugs, basically. Yeah, sure. You know, drinking marijuana and, and a lot of like the psychedelic type of stuff. That sure. Was the, that was the whole gambit that I was into. That was my world. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so I was... I was in that world and I got busted and I ended up in God's mercy. The people that it was, you know, got in trouble with didn't file something with the police directly. They said, let's handle this in house. Mm. And so that led to me getting kicked out of school for a year, you know, doing a bunch of community service and being under this like house arrest deal for like six months, which is crazy. Um, and so after that, well, even before that, I was already a little bit of the kid that you don't want your kid to hang out with. But after that, it was like, Black sheep, like keep away from this one, you know. Sure. Um, and I, I bounced back a little bit, and and I kind of I you know people talk about like a rebranding, you know, like mm-hmm. deal, like I'm gonna come up with a new image, I'm gonna remake myself. So at some point, I was like, I got tired of like the fighting that was connected with the punk rock skater world. Like yeah. I, would, I just like you know, I like I'm not quite as angry as you are. I try and pretend, <laughs> but I'm just not, you know. And I and I don't really I don't like the idea of somebody swinging a chain at me. Like that's not a you know I don't yeah. want to do that on the weekends. You know? Sure, like, yeah. It's so not my idea of a good time. Yeah, yeah. So, but I was like, I still love partying and all that, and I'm still like, I want to belong. So I did a switch up, and I like you know I went from like the sca- skater punk kid to like the neo hippie kid. This would say you're like a hippie skateboarder. All we need is love, brother. Yeah, yeah. Bro, come on, dude. Peace Drugs, love, psychedelics, and love. love baby. That's it, right? Sixties all over. This is, yeah, trying to live the dream, right? It was, but in in the midst of that, you know, um, so I changed out, right? Like I changed out my Jinko jeans, those big baggy ones from the '90s for the guys. Oh, remember sure, those bit, yeah. You know, I, I changed my, you know, I put on corduroys. You change your like DC skater shoes, you and now fit you've like got four other people. Yes, in those you pants. can, bro. Actually, you can fit a forty inside your sock in one of those pant legs. Sorry, anyhow, go. TMI maybe, but um, this is that was where I was at, but. The, uh, you know, traded all that in and now it's punk rock no longer, but now tie dye shirts and it's Grateful Dead and fish and all that kind of jazz. Right. So I'm like living in that world. And then I graduate high school and, and on the outside, my parents see, well, he's changed. He's no longer like he was before. And I played that card well. And then as college started, my mom and my dad were like, stay here as long as you want. But if you're in the house, there's one rule. You're the second of eight. And there's no way we're going to deal with all your younger brothers and sisters saying, Hey, listen, why does he not go to yeah. church on Sunday and I have to? So sure. if you're in the house, Sunday mass, that's it. It's just a done deal. Like it's part of the, yeah. you know, and, and I made the, you know, the calculated, you know, assessment that like one hour of my week yeah. for free room and board, that's I was right. like, that's a great deal. You, I work one hour a week in order to yeah. pay for my rent. And, it's a sus- a sus- yeah, yeah you think about that. Live. That is yeah. a great exchange. So, sure. But in my life interiorly, I was just like continuing to drown. And I remember going to this mass. I would always go to the vigil mass on Saturday because it was like trying to go out and party afterwards and, you know, the next day not have to wake up and go to mass. And it was at one of those masses and and the priest got up just before the final blessing and said, hey, we're going to have a few seminarians that are here with us uh, share their testimonies about how God called them to be a priest. And, you know, in my life, I was, was at that point, I guess I'm 18 going on 19. I'd never in my life thought about the priesthood. Mm-hmm. Not even for a split second. I saw a lot of really holy, and I'm grateful for it, a lot of holy lay people, but I didn't know any of my priests growing up, and they didn't yeah. know me. They couldn't have said my name. I mean, yeah. unless it was written on the paper when they go up to, like, you know, give you confirmation and they hold the paper up for the name, you know, you know, and then my sure. name was Larry. Like, Larry, I, you know, yeah. he seal you with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, good to see you again, exactly. Larry. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. So um, they now, didn't. I was going to ask you about that. So, like, this whole journey, there wasn't a priest that was just looking over and going, Hey, he's, he's in a place he needs help. Or there was nobody that really, from there, that kind of, there was position. no priest that was doing that, but there were, again, I mentioned my parents were connected with a, yeah. a wonderful, um, charismatic community in Augusta, Georgia called the Alleluia community, which is amazing. Would they you have, explain what charismatic means just shortly for people who may not know? Okay. Charismatic. Yeah. Um, so basically charismatic is the charismatic renewal. I'll explain that. Um, this is a little bit more contained than sure. trying to go into a theology of the Holy Spirit. Here. Sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> but charismatic renewal is in the late 60s, there was a grace given to a group of Catholics of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and certain gifts that you read about in the Acts of the Apostles began to be manifest in their lives. 
And it was also in conjunction with this fire that was lit in their hearts for deeper conversion, deeper fidelity to the church, the sacraments, scriptures, evangelization. And out of that, just kind of like it spread throughout the world. And at this point, like throughout the world, there's like millions and millions and millions of people who have experienced a grace of renewal in their mm-hmm. faith through what's referred to as the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So all these graces you get at baptism and confirmation often lie dormant. Mm-hmm. And this movement is sort of a grace God gave to awaken and stir into flame, as St. Paul writes about to Timothy, the gifts that were given already. Yeah. Um, and so in some cases, like my parents, there were people who are lay people, normal folks, who were like, I want my life to be more centered on Jesus. I want to be with others that are going to have that same priority and focus. And so they came together and mutually were committed to share life together and journey. Sure. So a community of families helping one another just walk the journey and grow in holiness of life and deal with the real stuff that happens as you're trying to live your faith in the world. Yeah. Um, and so I was, you know, I was raised in that atmosphere. My parents were, and so there were some really awesome lay people, fathers of friends or people that were connected with the community who at different points like reached out and I can look back and see like one of them, Keith Brown, like when I was like kicked out of school, like came and talked to me and talked about his own past and his journey, but I just couldn't, like I was just too caught up in fear. Sure. Yeah. That I couldn't receive it. And there was another great youth leader that was in the community, an older man at who um, name was Bill Concrete, who also reached out to me. But it was like, again, there was the tension. Like I could, you know, because I had this foundation, I kind of knew, but there was just like, no way. Like there's, I am, firstly, I'm just too much of a mess. I'm, and I don't want anything of what's going on inside. The insecurity, the fear, the, yeah. oh man. You know how like fear can get a hold of you? Yeah. And you're like, for the love of God, don't let anybody see. See me. Don't yeah. see me. And yeah. so you'll do anything to hide that. Yeah. And I, and I, and so I, I wasn't willing, man, I couldn't. And, um, and so I wasn't willing to open up and, and I was just, I realized, well, I'm really good at just becoming a chameleon. Yeah. And so I'll just do that. And people like me when I do that. You show <laughs> Anything up to, the, to anybody. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, you, you know, you like, you show up to the party and you walk in, yo, what's up everybody? You know, yeah. you like go to a keg stand. You're like, yeah, you do. You're out. Welcome. What's up? You know, yeah. like, you know, you're like all this, you're looking for like love and affirmation. Right. But it's like completely superficial. Yeah. It's the but masks, it, the mask we yeah. wear with this guy to these people. Oh, this dude. Guy to this and people. It, it, yeah. We do it with whatever, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be like the partying and the stupid stuff yeah. that we do as young people. Um, it's all sort of layers which we put on ourselves to try and like give me a sense of my worth Mm -hmm. to try and create a sense of who I am um, to try and tell that voice inside of me no you're good enough yeah like yeah you're, you're really, and maybe one of them you're will really be right, a man yeah right? I'm gonna try all of these and maybe one will be fit one well, will fit one will be me yeah. exactly yeah. yeah I mean it's like it's it's really it's it's a it's a difficult place to be in and and I was there, um, and I remember, you know, it was like at that mass where I was sitting there, and this priest tells us some seminarians are going to share their testimony. And I was just like, for the love of God, I'm like, please, like, st- mass is going to be an hour yeah. long. This is outrageous, right? Is this volunteer He's at like, this point? Yeah, or? I'm like, can I just walk out now? And I got up, and I went to the back of the church, and I'm like, I'm done. I'm like, guys, just, you know, and they're talking. And I was like, please sit down and shut up. You know, I was like, that's what I'm thinking inside. And so as I'm, as I'm sitting there, you know, like at the back getting more and more flustered with the fact that mass is going longer than I wanted and there's a party I'm supposed to go to, it's Saturday sure. night, uh, all of a sudden something happens is completely unexpected. And, uh, and I hear, and it's just like, I still don't know to this day, like, like what in the sense of like what the nature of what I heard was, was it a voice in my heart? Was it audible? I don't know. Was that it? Yeah. But I I mean, as clear as day, I heard Larry, will you be a priest for me too? Mm. (laughs) But that freaked you out a little bit, didn't it? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I tried to shake it off and I was like, what the heck was that? You know, there was other words, but I was was just like, I'm like, I'm freaked dude. And, um, and as I was, I was sitting there, like I was like, shake it off, you know, like don't nope, forget about it, you know. And then came back again, Larry, will you be a priest for me too? And it freaked me out, and I ran out of that church, like I left, yeah, and jumped in my car and said, you know what, God, I don't know if that was you, but if it is or it was, I don't want it. Yeah, like I've got a plan. This is not a part of it. Like I'm done. 
<laughs> and and yeah. it was a turning point, a further turning point of like really making a more conscientious decision to say like, I'm going to figure out life without you, God. Yeah. I've got this thing. And so what do you do, right? You go, you go on the sort of like merry-go-round of what the world offers you. Yeah. And it really is, it's, it's sad. And especially when you've tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord, you're like, my goodness, like the garbage that we accept. Yeah. And, yeah. and I was accepting it, man. And I dove in more to like, you know, the drugs is like all of a sudden, you know, oh, you get cool and you know, people and you know, you know, dealers, you know, this person, you just like, just escaping. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Running and running in relationships one after another. Isn't it funny? This is going to be a bad example. It's going to sound yeah. bad, but it's like sometimes God can seem like like a Michael Myers in a horror movie. Like you're running, you know, and then all of a sudden you like turn the corner and there's Michael Myers. You're like, how did you get here? And then you turn the other way and drive down the street and somehow he's there. And yeah. you're like, how are you getting in front of me like this? And that's how God can be in a good way in our life. It's like yeah. you're, you can run all you want, but I'm, I'm always here. Yeah. And so and it sounds like you started to experience some of that. Seriously, because like I was sitting here like trying to drown it out, man. And I just like the drug use just got more and more. The drinking, the partying, the relationships. And I was like, and I couldn't drown it out. Yeah. I'd be sitting in my bed at night in the dark and there's nobody around. And I couldn't fall asleep just yet. You know, that kind yeah. of moment. And, and all of a sudden I just hear again will you be a priest for me? And I was like freaked out, man. And I remember one time in my bed sitting there at night, just saying out loud, there's nobody else in the room. I'm like, shut up. Yeah, <laughs> stop it. I mean, seriously. I'm like, shut, like, leave me alone. Yeah. And so it got to the point where I was like, I need to change something and something's got to give. And so I decided like, I need a change of location. That's the yeah. issue. I'm in my hometown. I've got to get out of my parents' house. That's so, the epitome of running. Like I'm exactly, <laughs> like literally, I'm literally running now. So, yeah. I, and what did I do? I got in a van with some buddies and went and started following these jam band rock bands around yeah. the southeast. You know, <laughs> widespread panic, string cheese incident. You know, you have yeah. oysterhead, all these groups fish, out there. Oh, fish, yeah. yeah. So we're like out in this whole world, you know, living the dream, right? This is now it's like this is like the epitome of the hippie dream is to be like living in a van, traveling from show to show. In a you perpetual know. cloud of marijuana Exactly. Smoke. <laughs> Just like, whoa, dude, you know. And Scooby Snacks. Exactly, yeah. bro. Um, I mean, so, I mean, it was ridiculous. So I yeah. literally were like, uh, the way we made our money was we were selling all organic veggie burritos in the parking lots of shows, bro. Jeez. This is like stereotype yeah. on steroids, yeah. right? It was How like, many people that spent hours in a porta potty are yeah. probably angry at you still to this day? Oh, man. Yeah. No, we had a converter for the battery. We put a crock pot and we got to the parking lot and like hook up a uh you for, know for the beans <laughs> i was riding down i-20 jamming out chopping on yeah. the chopping board in the back with the smell of cilantro every time i smell cilantro i still like a flashback i'm like in a van driving yeah. down the highway going to a show don't drink the purple kool-aid exactly yeah, seriously right. man or the red don't do any either of them bro and um anyhow so i'm i'm in that world but then like again so quickly like the veneer comes off yeah and the emptiness that's in my heart doesn't get cured by another show and another show and another show or another hit or another type of drug or another relationship. Um, and I found myself at one of those shows in Mobile, Alabama and God in his mercy, like he moved quickly for me. And I, I can only say it's just like mercy. I don't know. Yeah. I still don't know why. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm sure you got a similar experience Dude, with your story. With it. Yeah. You're just like, why me? Like I know so many people, right? Yeah. Who yeah. are still like stuck in that world, and I'm like, how did? I don't know. I re I, re I remember in in my own just like the drugs, the cocaine, the yeah, I yeah. did it all too, acid, all those things, everything you do besides heroin, basically. And I remember every one of them at some point, whether it was marijuana, mm -hmm. at some point, like I stopped getting high, and I just was just I was getting high, trying but to get you high, were... but I didn't feel it. Like I was yeah. just like numb. Yeah. And the same thing with cocaine. Dude. Like it just got to a point where it was like, yes, there's nothing like I've come to the point where I can feel that physically I'm going, I'm going to go off a cliff. Yeah. If I do any more of this yeah. and it's not, it's not giving me what I'm looking for. Yeah. How much more of this do I have to do? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I, I know exactly what you're talking about through this. Yeah. And so I, I remember I went into the show and as I'm, in the midst of this concert, everything's happening, glow sticks and bouncy balls or beach balls in the air and the lights and oh, girl, sure. girls in flower dresses spinning around, you know, everybody's yeah. on their own journey. Yeah. And I'm up front right near the speakers, you know, like, yeah. you know, and, um, and in the midst of all of that, like I just got stopped and, and just looked around and I just saw the emptiness 
of just the people's uh, smiles around me. There's something about it that I was just like, I'm empty and they're empty. Yeah. And we're all looking for something. And I had met somebody on that trip who was raised in a, a, a family that had no faith. And he was hitting his rock bottom and he didn't even know where to go. And I just realized like, I don't belong here. And, wow. and, and the Lord's like, you don't like come follow me. And at that point I wasn't like completely converted. I just knew that like my life sucked so much <laughs> that I was open to anything. Yeah, anything must be better than Anything's this. Anything's gotta yeah, be better, bro. I'm familiar with that too. Gotta be better. And yeah. so I just, and I walked out and I made my way back home. And when I got back to Augusta, Georgia, where I'm from, there was an awesome priest who was back. He's a was a missionary priest in Africa for years, and uh, and he was home on sabbatical. And when I got back, he he looked me up and reached out to me. He just had a heart for prodigals, man. Yeah, a heart for the God lost, the black sheep. And so, like, because again, like this is the first time like I ever knew a priest, and a priest knew my name that I could remember. Yeah. I mean, maybe they did, and God bless. I apologize to my pastors that. You know, if they ever were to see it and feel like they let me down or something, I don't know. I just, sure, I wasn't aware of it anyhow. And, um, and yet, so he said, You don't want to get lunch? I'm like, Sure, let's get lunch. We get lunch and it's all superficial. It's like your Thanksgiving response to aunts and uncles when they ask you, What's going on? How are you doing? Sure. You give them your sort of like, you know, your canned speech about, you oh, know, yeah. Well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to study this. I'm doing, you know. <laughs> sure. And so I gave him all of that superficial business. And at the end of it, just before leaving, he just looks at me. He's like, so like, Larry, is there anything else in your heart that you want to talk about? You know, anything at all? And as he looked at me, I was just like, I felt naked. I was like, yeah, like this, don't see it. Don't this, see it. This, this you know, guy sees me. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, so much of my life just spent with that fear of like, don't see it. Don't oh, yeah. see it. Don't see this. Yeah. And, and so I was like, yeah, if you got a second, Father Ted, you know, a couple of things going on. Yeah. <laughs> a few issues Two I might issues, want to discuss. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I was still using it at this point. Like I was like, I mean, I hadn't, like I said, like a con something had happened, but it wasn't really like a full like yeah. grace of conversion. And, um, and so I sat down and I started talking and I just remember my heart was just, just weighed down. I just started weeping and. And Father Ted pulls out a stole, and he's like, "Hey, you want to just go ahead and make this confession?" And I'm like, "Yeah, Father Ted, whatever." You know, it's yeah, just like sure. <laughs> it was I the most like half-hearted, like <laughs> repentant sure. conversion. I don't know what, but I you just know. happen to have this on me. Exactly, bro. Yeah, moments, like, just like no, these. I mean, seriously, I knew it was completely premeditated, and yeah. I premeditate things now, bro. Come there on, you go. I'm, I'm ready, bro. <laughs> God bless you. I'm ready, man. Anytime, <laughs> let's do it. And uh, anyhow, other days, other stories about God's mercy, but. Sure. Um, but it, you know, heard my confession and I poured everything out and it was the first time, bro, that I opened my heart up and so many things I was ashamed of. So many things I hated about myself. Yeah. And I didn't want anybody to know. And so I couldn't look at them. I couldn't raise my eyes. <sighs> I couldn't raise my eyes and look at them. And, um, <laughs> And he just said simple words that that just like broke through in a way that I still can't explain. And he just said, you know, Larry, that was that was beautiful. I've always known you had a wonderful heart. Oh man. And um Praise God. And I knew at that moment with a certainty that is inexplicable to me, I knew that somebody knew everything about me that I hated. <laughs> Yeah. And somebody knew everything about me that I was ashamed of. And they loved me. Loved you in spite of it. <laughs> they loved me in it, man. Yeah. They saw something wonderful that I couldn't even see. And I knew that it was Jesus. And the reality of that love with the encounter of Jesus and that you in that confession, man, it rocked me. And I remember receiving absolution. It was just like I had been living inside a cage. Freaking walls came down, man. I mean, my heart just like broke and I was just weeping and weeping and weeping. And I walked out of there and it was like, what the heck happened to the world? All of a sudden, like it was like going from the Andy Griffith black and white, you know, <laughs> into like high dev virtual yeah. reality. Like 
the clouds, where did they come from? Yeah. The trees. I was like, there's birds. I haven't heard birds singing and I don't know how long. And then all of a sudden I just like, I find myself smiling. I'm like, what's going on to my face? You know, yeah, it's like, sure. and I'm like, all of a this sudden, this, yeah, this is weird. <laughs> I haven't done this in a while. Right? right. And, and I'm like, and I'm totally sober. And all of a sudden this peace just came flooding in a joy. And then all of a sudden a power came that was not mine. And all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I could look at friends and other people when they were asking me to do the things that were destroying me. And I could say, no, yeah, I'm not doing that anymore, man. I'm following God. Yeah. Mm. And, and within two months, it was just like this, like, I, it's, it's just, I can't explain it, bro. It's, God's real. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> God's yeah. real. And within two months, I went from daily drug user to daily communicant. Yeah. And yeah. that's like, yeah. it's because Jesus is alive and he's real. And he can do the things that you cannot. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, our, our stories are very similar in that way. I mean, I did the same thing. Like, priest took me under his wing, daily communicant, and have been for years. And it, it changed my life, the power of the Eucharist, all of those things, yeah. the strength that God gives us to himself. But like I, this, what you're talking about here is the core of this ministry. It's how this whole thing started, and mm. and like I, I want men to really hear what you're saying right now. That yeah. this, the struggle, the tears, the the pain, because I think there's a lot of people out there that are probably in those places right now of like, I don't want to drink anymore. Like I don't want this. I don't want to talk to my wife this way anymore. Yeah. I don't want to be a slave to 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 these things on my phone. I'm looking at. Yeah. I don't. I don't want to be a slave to my anger, my unforgiveness, my pain. My, yeah. And, and it's, you try everything. It's like you're throwing all this junk in a pit and, and you never hear it hit the bottom and it never fills yeah. up and you never see it coming towards the top yeah. where you have a relief. Okay, well, I'm about to fill this up. There's never any of that yeah. until you surrender. Yeah. And that's what you're talking about here is just yeah. that, that surrender from our Lord where finally – you turn and face him, and he's like, "This is what I've been waiting for." Yeah. And here's the, here's the gift of my yeah. very self. Yeah. I That's am, what changes everything. Yeah. Like I haven't been waiting to tell you you really screwed up this time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've been waiting to tell you that I love you, my son. Hugging you and all of your that's yeah. what I, you, you talked about the prodigal son last night and yeah and you talked about it with this priest and that's one of my favorite things to remember is like in that scripture it never stop, it says that he like stopped off at the flying J to take a shower <laughs> right like he yeah. just he, he's filthy and he was dealing with pigs mm -hmm. right so I mean there wasn't just pig food and mud in there yeah dung and all this other yeah. stuff and 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 then here he comes and the father just rushes out and embraces him and gets all of that dirtiness yeah he doesn't even care yeah right and then says yeah, put on my finest things and yeah god and he wants to do it for each and every one of us yeah because his love heals us man yeah it's like everybody else you know it's like they come near somebody who's sick and and that person's contagious and they get sick yeah god comes towards us and we're sick and he's contagious and we get healed amen well well, well said I don't ever heard that said like that before. I've never said it before. It must be the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Definitely not me. <laughs> Glad he's showing up. We'd be in trouble Come if he on. wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Two fools and two microphones. That's right. The Holy Spirit. All day long. <laughs> so so you, you have this conversion moment. Yeah. You're saying no to things you were so easily saying yes to before. Yeah. Confession, There's, bro, right. became a huge part. Yeah. And I'm so grateful because that priest that heard that first confession said, I don't care how often it is. You're always welcome to come back. Yeah. And dude, in those first weeks, two or three times a week. God bless that priest, man. Cause this cause cause addiction's real and sin's real and the chains are real and the habits that we've got in our lives are real. And it takes time and it takes real grace to break them. And yeah. and it was the ongoing experience of coming back again. And it wasn't like, oh man, you I can't believe you're you're here confessing the same thing again. And it was the same embrace every time. Yeah. And that was like, okay, it's okay. Yeah. Like, it's okay that I don't have it all together. It's okay that I'm still struggling. It's okay that I'm not there yet. It's not about the fall. It's about the getting back up. Yeah. yeah. It's not about my mess. It's a, it's about his love for me. Yeah. And, and like my eyes are on Jesus. I can walk on water. Yeah. And walking on water might be saying no to porn for you. It might be not picking up the bottle. It might be not raising your hand in violence. It might be, you know, forgiving 
Yeah. Whatever the impossible for you right now is, is possible when our eyes are on Jesus. Yeah. And that's what began to change my life. And, and then I began to discover, you know, introduced to Eucharistic adoration. I was like, what the heck is this? You know, yeah. um, introduced, you know, like re- rather reintroduced, like I found my rosary, which, you know, it's like, I, I knew it, but I was also like, I'd forgotten like the mysteries you know, like, and so just a word to guys, like guys, I think in general, like we're, we're not into wanting to do things that we don't feel confident about. Mm-hmm. And so very often, like we won't lead, like, you know, like, you know, uh, the husband's not going to like lead a family rosary because he's sure. like, I'm not really sure what the next mystery is, oh, right? Sure, you know, it's yeah. like, or I'm not going to do this because I don't feel like I'm comfortable with it. I don't know what it is. And it's like, you know, like I, I had to get, I just had to be humble and ask somebody. I remember sheepishly asking a friend of mine, I was like, hey, dude, I know like your family like prays the rosary like every week. It's after my conversion, right? Sure. So all of a sudden you start, the Lord sends new brothers who are able to help you on that oh, journey. Yeah. I'm like, um, do you, you mind like just showing me? Like, you know, I, was just, I felt like such a lame-o Catholic. Oh, sure. I'm like, but he's like teaching me, you know, again, um, something I already knew. I'm finding my Bible and like the dust that had collected on the Bible I was given in confirmation six or seven years before that, right? Yeah. And it was stuffed in a back corner. And all of a sudden, man, the word of God. Holy cow. Come on alive. Yeah. Dude, I read the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's not like a pat me on the back. It was like, I couldn't stop. Yeah. I was like, better than Tom Clancy novel. Like, this yes. is like amazing. You know, <laughs> whoa, it's a word of God. And, and it was speaking to me and it was healing me and it was re educating my way of thinking about myself and reality and others. Yeah, it was and no like, longer black words on a white page. Yeah, it was a you, living word. Yeah, of God. and Romans twelve became true, right? It's <laughs> yeah. like be transformed by the renewal of your mind, and what renews my mind, an encounter with the truth of who God is and who I am before Him, which also so shows me who you are, right? Sure. And yeah. so that transformation happened by being deep immersed in the Word, being deep immersed in the Eucharist, and then from that, all of a sudden, I'm like, I, I looked around, and as I was reading the lives of saints and everything, you know. I was like, saw this like this fire for wanting to share this with others, yeah. And in the first place that I was able to do that was with the poor, okay. and it changed my life. I still remember, man. Yeah, I did a mission trip in El Paso. Do my heart just gets moved? <laughs> That's okay. But please pour, pour it out. And and I remember going into a little shack in the middle of nowhere in the dump of. Um, uh, sorry, no, Juarez is on the Juarez, other side of the yeah. border from El Paso. And like walking in and this woman just being like nothing in her house. And we're bringing her food and clean water because she's got no water, no food. And she's just got a little bed in the corner and um, a propane powered, like, you know, a little small stove, like single burner deal. Sure. And uh, in a, in a, like a milk crate, plastic milk crate. And I like come in and, and she's just like so like filled with light. And she's just like, welcome, bienvenidos. Siéntate, you're like, welcome, sit down. And I remember, like, I'm sitting here looking at her, and and she's got nothing. And and she's filled with light. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I was like, I need, I need what you have. And this is after my conversion. I think I'm coming on a mission trip. I'm coming to help. Sure, I'm and, here. I've arrived. Yeah, and like yeah. Jesus says, like, you know, whatever you do to the least of my brother, you do it to me. But I realize it's not just you do it to me, but I'm going to do it to you through them. Yeah. I'm going to do something in your heart. And I went back from that trip knowing that my life never could just go back and be the same in the sense of I knew that I wasn't just going to go back and finish school, get married, and live in Georgia. Yeah. Something had been touched in my heart, and it was part of this call, a missionary call, which later I went to the diocese and discerned with them. And it was just like it wasn't, it wasn't right. It didn't fit. I looked at marriage again and was like, maybe this is like one of those Abraham and Isaac things, right? With sure, the priesthood. Sure, I was like, I tried, Lord. <laughs> I gave you the good, you know, good, good try. I wasn't so married, everything. And it wasn't it, right? Yeah. Um, and, and thought I was going to get married, you know, totally in love. And, and the Lord, like, wouldn't allow me to take that step. And So I knew, you were with somebody. Yeah, at time. yeah. Okay. So you, yeah. And, and I knew that I couldn't. I knew that I couldn't take that step because I knew that, um, God had something. I, I, just, oh, I hated it, man. Yeah, it's tough when the Lord, when you have something that's like <laughs> so good and so beautiful and so right and all of the like good holy ways. Yeah, and He says let go, and I remember that He did the same thing again for me. And I, I want to talk about it maybe in the Advent um, episode sure. a little bit more about that part of the journey. But sure, but this experience, man, of the love of Jesus is why I'm here today. Yeah, and 
And I know it's real, bro, because that was 22 years ago, man. <laughs> you've been a priest for what, 14 years? Or you've been I've been a, a, friar a friar for 14, 14 years. Priest I've been a priest two? for two and a half. I'm yeah. a pandemic priest. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God for the pandemic for that yeah. reason alone. And um, and this love's real, man. It's like every other thing that I tried, I came down from. Yeah. Didn't matter how great the drug was. Didn't matter how great the party was. Didn't matter how great the relationship may have been for whatever time it was. Everything else you come down from. Yeah. But if it's really him, there's no coming down. I don't mean that there's not suffering and that there's not pain. Yeah, struggle. low moments, high moments, no, things but like, like that. I'm not alone, man. Yeah, <laughs> never. And it doesn't matter how screwed up I still might be. And I still am. We're on the journey with the healing. Yeah. We talk about that a lot, right? Sure. Like he sees me, he knows me, he loves me, man. That's all that matters. Yeah. And I think most men just are looking to know that that's true for them too. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, that's half the feedback we have all the time that comes in from here is just, I know there's something more. Yeah. I want to stop being the person I am. Yeah. You know, nothing's working. Uh, you know, the, all the, the climbing the ladder of success and it not being enough. Yeah. And all the things that we're told from a young age, if I just, if I do this, this, and this, if I check these boxes and I'll yeah. finally be happy. Yeah. And then most guys wind up in their thirties going, all right, I, I went to school, I excelled at a sport, I graduated or got a vocational job and I, I made my six figures or whatever. Yeah. And, and I met the beautiful girl. I've got the house, the picket fence, the couple of, you know, 2.5 kids. If you're not, you know, Catholic 9.8, whatever. Yeah. But like, <laughs> I've got all of this and, and I'm still not like something's still missing. Yeah. You know, and, and it is, it's, it sounds like cliche because everybody says that, you know, there's a piece of your heart that, that, that doesn't belong to you and you can't refill it. It's, mm -hmm. it's God's to get yeah. back to you. And, I mean, you're a testament to that. I mean, you really are. Like your story, and I think that's it's one reason why we're so kindred. We've been down some rough roads that are in yeah. similar places, and the Lord just kind of reached down into the into the war as dumps of our hearts, yeah, right, yeah. And, and pulled us out of that. Yeah. But so obviously now you're you're a Franciscan friar of the renewal, mm -hmm. and as you've told this story, you can see why you might be drawn to them. They're they yeah. work with the poor and all those things. Yeah. So so what what was that like? What Obviously, you said you tried the diocesan thing, so there was something there that didn't call to you yeah. the way it has other priests. But w what was it about the Franciscans? And I would say you know? um, the first thing is uh, Francis was a brother. Yeah. I grew up my whole life. I have five brothers. Oh, yeah. And I just knew that, like, I, I, I don't know how to live my life without brothers. Yeah. And mm -hmm. what I found in the friars were real men who were being real brothers to one another. And that's kind of probably one of the core things. And the other is, is I know that the Lord's called me to be a missionary. Like, I don't know, since that conversion, there's been in my heart this word that just has not stopped, which just says, go. Mm. And I know that he sent me, and there's something about the fact that our community is also a missionary community. I've been blessed to serve uh, almost four and a half years over the course of these 14 years in Nicaragua and Central America. Yeah. Blessed to do missions in Europe and South America and just around the U.S., you know, such a gift to be a part of the National Eucharistic Revival because of that. So so the missionary call, mm -hmm. um, which included that being near with the poor and then that fraternity, the authentic brotherhood, authentic men, you know, just yeah. like, these are dudes. I'm like, you're yeah. talking about the dude bro, man. Like, <laughs> these are dudes, you know, like the Franciscans, the friars, the guys. I'm like, and I can live my life here. And I think the last thing I would say is, is I was looking for guys that I could run after Jesus with yeah, and not just walk after Jesus with. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, that's, that's again, the heart of this ministry, you know, we're not all called to be priests or friars, brothers, no. and, but we all need that authentic community. And Amen. that's, that's what we do here. I mean, is to go into these parishes and yeah. places and start these places so men can have what you're talking about. Yeah. That authentic, there's something just amazing about doing life with other people that yeah. it's, it, it is, you know, when you try to do this alone, the, the devil's like a sniper, mm -hmm. you know, he's waiting for you to just walk oh, out. Yeah. It's like the lion that waits for the one gazelle to come off the pack. Oh yeah. And then he's just, you know, like oh, scripture yeah, says, he's prowling like a roaring lion. Dude, and, live that. Yeah. And, 
But when you're running with other people like that, whether it is a call to the priesthood and you're in mm-hmm. in in a version of the priesthood, a type of the priesthood where you have brothers, yeah. or just simply the fact that you're a lay person, a lay man that's out here right now that just says, I need other people to do you life do. with. Amen. Yeah. I mean, maybe if, if that's what you're feeling right now, then God is calling you to maybe institute one of those things, yeah. to, to start one of those things. Yeah. And, you know, we're happy to help do that, and I'm sure Father is happy to welcome you into come on <laughs> into discernment to the that's priesthood right. if that's yeah, what seriously if that's what it is. But yeah, I mean, Father, I, I just I thank you so much for opening your heart, dude. I, this is as you were talking this whole time. I thought just inside because of my my relationship with you, my love for you as a brother, mm. and then to hear you in the way that you just so vulnerably vulnerably poured your heart out. I think that's what the world needs. We spent, I think, till midnight talking about this <laughs> last <sure> night. <laughs> and, yeah. and I just, I thank you for that because I think this is going to be one of the most powerful episodes we've ever had hmm. uh, just because of your willingness to, to say, here I am in everything. Yeah. You know, and that's what the world needs. I think we need more examples of people that are willing to say, I'm not perfect. Yes, I'm a priest of the Lord, yeah. but I still have struggles and I still have issues. And yep. yes, I'm intrinsically different and I can transubstantiate and you can't. <laughs> Don't throw that in anybody's face, by the way. That's but, right. <laughs> but, but the fact is I still have issues and I still have brokenness. And that's something, too, that we preach is like to love mm. on your priests, to love on your religious because – yeah. It's not like you you make this transition, and I don't mean to speak for you or the priesthood, but it's not like you you choose this in your life, and then all the temptations, all the 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 the, the yeah. hardships go away, and you're yeah. just perfectly impervious from that for yep. the rest of your life. Yeah, you struggle just like everybody else. Absolutely. I mean, Jesus didn't come to save angels; he say he came to save human beings. Yeah, and we still have our our humanity and. And the redemption of our humanity is going on like this me being changed into the man i'm really meant to be it, that's that's the process the journey the struggle the battle of the of life yeah and so like yeah we're not there yet but that's 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 fine bro yeah. i was like but i'm not taking my eyes off the top of the mountain yeah and i'm not turning back yeah you're like the most of the roads in Memphis constantly under construction. <laughs> That's right, yep. man. And, and we'll praise God for it. Mm-hmm. Father Malky, what, what a gift you are to the church, to me individually, as a friend and a brother. Likewise. Bro. And to these men now. Um, yeah. Before we close out this episode, uh, I, you know, I want people to consider this, this uh, as you listen to this, if you've been moved by this, to consider supporting uh, the Franciscan Friars. Uh, they of the renewal they they do amazing work i mean father i want to let you share a little bit about what you do where you're located how people can give those sort of things to support what you guys are doing yeah so um well our two main missions and apostolates are work with the poor materially poor wherever we're at and then also Mm -hmm. evangelization and where i live is in the south bronx we have a full-time homeless shelter for men in the city 26 beds saint anthony's shelter of renewal okay there's a website for that that people could look at um, and you can donate to donate directly to that shelter Uh, but for the community at large and we do need help i mean our community was just actually talking to me about this recently just the the reality right of um the pandemic made everybody struggle and that includes us and we live from donations we don't have any any income um, yeah, it took a vow of poverty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so to donate or to be able to see what we're doing a little bit more, you can check out our website, franciscanfriars.com. Okay. And there's as soon as you get on there, there's a link on the top right corner. Maybe I could share that with you, and you could post it up in the comments Yeah, we'll as put well. it in the show notes, yeah. Yeah, the show notes. So Yeah, yeah and that would be, I mean, so grateful. I mean, any any donation. So, it's, so if you donate to the Friars, it is going to go to, um, you can tag it if you want it to go directly to work with the poor or you can donate to the friars in general, and that's going to go to the needs of the community, the friars, which, I mean, ultimately that's some of the health, you know, health coverage um, and and some of our maintenance of our friaries that we live in. Sure. And then beyond that, you know, everything else right in our constitutions, any money we get sure. that we don't need, it goes to the poor. So yeah. um, if somebody is like super generous and you're like, yeah, I just want to write you a massive check, and it's like we don't need it, uh, it you just give it to us in general – we're going to pass that along. It'll get funneled right into the, the works that to we're the doing needs. with the poor, the needs of those brothers and sisters who, you know, and it's a gift for us because what it is, is part of our vocation as Franciscans mm-hmm. is to provide an opportunity for um, relationship and contact between people who might not be living in the South Bronx, yeah, might not know where or how to give and want to do something. And, and we're able to receive that 
and then give it to the person who has the need. Yeah. Um, and so it is a real joy to help people to be able to, because if you're blessed with a lot, you're not blessed for yourself. Amen. You're blessed to be able to help the work of the kingdom. Yeah, provide for the needs of your family and, and those those things of your own life. But like God gives freely. Yeah. In order that we can give freely. Yeah. Um, and so whatever that looks like for, for any of the guys that are watching the show, super grateful. We, we do need it. We, we support ourselves only through our donations, essentially. That's where it all comes from. Abba Father. Sure. And yeah. he's good in providing, too. So, amen. Um, amen. He, if he's asking you to give, you can bet that he's got something else planned for you. He's not, yeah. You don't have to worry about it. Just, yeah. You're a steward of it. It's not yours. Yeah. Right? You're just a steward of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one last thing, too. So you're preaching for the National Eucharistic Revival. That's right. I'm sure there's going to be some people that say, I want to bring this guy Fire! in after hearing this. <laughs> Fire! <laughs> so what, uh, how can they get a hold of you to be able to bring you in to do a mission or to speak or um, do something in conjunction with the golly. revival? Yeah, well, I guess you can, you can make a request. There's two options. One, uh, make a request to the USCCB, but I think at this point those things happen from whoever the diocesan point person is for okay. a diocese for the revival and the committee that's organizing everything. Sure. That's one option. If it's something that's kind of official um, USCCB revival event, yeah. Um, I'm also done a lot of other things where it's a parish is like, hey, you want to come and. They'll reach out. So there's requests you can make through our website. There's a there's a, a a request for an event, and you can mention a particular friar's name. FranciscanFriars.com. FranciscanFriars.com. Okay. Okay. There's a application or request for you know a mission or whatever, and you just fill out that form. And if you put my name in there, then I'll get it. And if the Lord allows it, I'm I mean I'm telling you, I just love talking about Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I love I, people I, meeting him, especially in the Eucharist. Yeah, I think people can get, they get that feeling now. <laughs> And I can, if you need a testimony to how much he loves Jesus, I'll be glad to share with you. But <laughs> well, all right, Father, this is a man again. What a blessing to have you. You know how much I love you, dude. Yeah, I, I mean, love just you too, to, yeah, to have you as a brother in the Lord. And Amen. would you mind just sending us off with a blessing here at the end? Yeah. Okay, Heavenly Father, we just pray right now. Pray for all the men who are watching and and those who will watch that. Heavenly Father, you would fill their hearts with an awareness of how much you love them. No matter where they've been, no matter what's happened, no matter what they're fighting and struggling with, Father, let them know that they are your beloved son. And let that love, Lord, bring freedom and healing to them. And I ask that through the prayers of St. Francis of Assisi and St. Joseph and St. Paul, that Almighty God would bless each and every one of you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us, Father. My pleasure, bro. All right.